Welcome to Jack's Waterfront Restaurant, a place that's seen its fair share of drama and transformation. Today we're diving back into the turbulent waters of Season 2 of Kitchen Nightmares, revisiting the St. Clair Shores Michigan Gem. The summer resort community, just 40 minutes from Detroit, boasts prime real estate along the picturesque shores of Lake St. Clair. But as the seasons change, so does Jack's fate. In the summer, it thrives, but come winter, it's almost on life support. And the cast of characters running this show? Well, they're a trio of bodybuilders, Bill, Scott, and Tamar, along with Tamar's father, AJ, as the general manager. But here's the twist. AJ's presence seems to cause more chaos than anything else. We've got the scoop on what happened after Gordon Ramsay visited Jax in March 2008. Did these muscle-bound managers turn this ship around? Or did it sink further into culinary turmoil? AJ, Tamar's father, was initially brought in to address the quality control issues plaguing Jack's waterfront restaurant. However, his involvement in the business only seemed to exacerbate the problems. Instead of diligently working to improve the food quality, AJ's time was often spent in idle chit-chat with customers. And when the workday transitioned into night, where he indulged in copious amounts of Ouzo, his beloved black licorice-flavored drink. As AJ reveled in the bar's festivities, the restaurant was suffering a slow decline. It was disheartening to witness how AJ, the supposed general manager, and also Tamar's father, took advantage of his son's investment. With over four decades of restaurant experience under his belt, he was earning a substantial $100,000 per year to oversee the restaurant. Yet, his actions painted a very different picture. He frequently drank excessively during service, joined customers for a smoke, and shirked responsibility for the restaurant's operations. The situation was a sad tale of misplaced trust and neglect of duty. The issues plaguing Jack's restaurant run deeper than just AJ's problematic role. Scott, one of the owners, emerged as a significant concern due to his aggressive and often intimidating behavior. It had reached a point where the other two owners felt compelled to relegate Scott to a silent partnership attempting to mitigate the discord within the team. In an effort to rectify the problems AJ had caused, they introduced a new chef, Aaron. However, even with Aaron's expertise, the owners have struggled to grant him the autonomy needed to implement crucial changes. Micromanagement has stifled Aaron's ability to make the necessary improvements, leaving the restaurant mirrored in its existing issues. To compound the already dire situation, the restaurant finds itself burdened by substantial debts and looming tax obligations. The financial pressures are mounting, and the future looks increasingly uncertain. With all these challenges, it's evident that Jack's restaurant is in desperate need of Gordon Ramsay's intervention. His expertise and guidance may be the lifeline this establishment requires to survive and thrive once more. In one of Chef Ramsay's most unforgettable restaurant entrances, he rolled up to Jack's restaurant on a snowmobile over frozen Lake St. Clair, making a grand start to his visit. Upon entering, Gordon Ramsay is warmly greeted by AJ, only to be taken aback when AJ informs him that he's not the owner. A quick gesture from AJ introduces Scott as the true owner, Ramsay initially assuming he must be the bouncer given his imposing physique and posture. Taking a seat with Bill and AJ, Ramsay delves into the heart of the restaurant's issues. The unanimous belief among the staff is that AJ is at the root of the problems. He's been busy sipping ouzo all day, despite holding the position of restaurant manager and pulling in a substantial $100,000 annually back in 2008, during the turbulent times of the Great Recession. With all that said, it's time for Gordon to sample the food and judge for himself. He inquires about the crab with a K from the waitress, who clarifies that the K denotes its artificial crab. Artificial crab meat in a seafood restaurant with a waterfront view? Quite the paradox. Gordon's taste test of the fake crab omelet ends swiftly with him spitting it out after just one bite. Aaron, the chef, is frustrated that he's compelled to work with artificial and frozen ingredients, but he lacks the authority to modify the menu since AJ remains content with the food. Next up is the fish and chips. A dish you'd expect a place named Jack's on the waterfront to excel at, right? Unfortunately, it falls short, turning out rubbery and overly greasy. As Ramsay bluntly puts it, When you take a bite of that cod, it's almost like you've got a breaded condom in your mouth. Gross. 
Throughout his ordeal, Scott remains a passive observer, staring at Ramsey as if he was some kind of exhibit in a zoo. It's a wonder Ramsey didn't call him out on it. Having endured one of the worst meals of his life, Gordon heads to the kitchen to have a conversation with the chef. Aaron, consumed by shame, openly admits that the food is subpar but feels like he's being unfairly scapegoated, bearing all the responsibility but lacking the authority to implement the changes he believes are necessary. At this point, Ramsey reaches his breaking point. Who's controlling the fucking menu? The owners are. Scott disagrees with this. AJ gets defensive and claims he is not the one responsible for the lousy food choices. AJ has many excuses and never wants to own up to his faults. <laughs> it's terrible. AJ, it's got to be your responsibility. No, no. Gordon deems it necessary to observe the dinner service to gain a comprehensive understanding. As the service unfolds, he takes a moment to have a conversation with Tamar regarding his father. In the meantime, Aaron's frustration grows as he grapples with the kitchen's limitations. Dishes remain undelivered to the diners, resulting in many customers leaving in frustration. Throughout this chaos, AJ seems more interested in socializing with patrons, taking smoke breaks, and contributing little to improve the service. Due to the dismal service, a significant amount of food either ends up in the trash or is given away for free. After the restaurant finally closes for the evening, Ramsey gathers the four guys to uncover the root of the issues that need to be addressed. Who has the final say at Jack's? They point to AJ, a veteran of the restaurant business, as having let them down, as they thought he was going to come in and fix their business. At this point, the only one getting a paycheck is AJ, with his 100k a year salary. None of the owners are getting paid. That was a tough time during the Great Recession when restaurant sales, particularly gourmet-type stuff like seafood, took a massive hit as consumer spending was weak due to the poor economy. Right. So, that's a tough spot for you. Yes. AJ remains steadfast in his defiance. The following day, Ramsey returns for the dreaded inspection of the walk-in refrigerator, revealing a true kitchen nightmare. Gordon invites Aaron and the owners to join him inside to witness the unsanitary conditions, including a sheet pan filled with frozen risotto that clings to the tray like cement. AJ, however, is reluctant to take any responsibility for the deteriorating state of the back of house operations. Instead, he points fingers at the owners, deflecting blame onto them. In response to the dire situation, a comprehensive cleanup is ordered. While the cleanup unfolds, Chef Ramsay meets with local fishermen to explore untapped resources right outside Jack's doors, fresh fish. Gordon even tries his hand at ice fishing and manages to pull a tiny fish from the icy waters. With his newfound catch, Gordon plans to create a delectable chowder. He brings Aaron along, imparting a valuable culinary lesson on the young chef. Oh my gosh, I'm standing here next to Chef Ramsay. He's showing me food that he likes and he thinks will work. They introduce a new salmon dish, along with the freshly caught chowder, which is now served in a delightful bread bowl. In a surprising twist, Ramsay assigns Scott to work as a waiter in a section of the restaurant. This serves as a test to determine if Scott can set aside his macho persona and adopt to the role of a waiter. As the night goes on, things get backed up in the kitchen as it struggles to keep up with the demand, causing diners to become increasingly impatient. Meanwhile, Aaron, who has only been part of the restaurant's team for a few weeks, is putting forth his best efforts in the kitchen. However, the rest of the cooks aren't providing much assistance. I don't know nothing. Be honest, I, I don't know. Orders in the kitchen are piling up, and it's turning into a chaotic situation. Chef Ramsay eventually steps into the kitchen to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the cooks, rallying them to work together. This intervention comes as a huge relief to Aaron, who had been shouldering the entire load on his own. Finally, food starts flowing out of the kitchen, and to everyone's surprise, Scott is managing decently as a waiter. Not long after, though, plates start returning to the kitchen due to quality issues. Throughout all this, AJ has proven to be entirely unhelpful, even becoming flustered when tensions rise in the kitchen. The situation in the kitchen goes from bad to worse with the unproductive kitchen crew. Give it to me again without all the grease in the bottom. After yet another challenging dinner service, Ramsay reconvenes with the owners, along with Aaron. In a candid moment, Ramsay confronts AJ, suggesting that if it were his restaurant, he would consider slashing AJ's salary by 50%. It's a statement that needed to be said. 
Gordon's renovation team works tirelessly throughout the night to transform Jax. They introduce fish tanks, addressing a prior absence, along with captivating bubble lights in the ceiling. Corrugated steel panels and stylish mini fish tanks adorn the walls, creating a remarkable change that greatly impresses the owners. Accompanying the redesign is a brand new menu, featuring fresh fish and chips, hailed by Ramsey as the best in Michigan. On the third day, the relaunch is in jeopardy due to a winter storm. However, the restaurant perseveres and fills the capacity, defying the odds and signaling a hopeful new beginning. Taco! Just taco! As Aaron grapples once more with kitchen staff issues, customer orders begin to pile up, causing delays. Amidst the mounting stress of the evening, AJ is sent to the kitchen. The thing is, though, his presence makes the situation worse. The lack of effective communication among the cooks becomes evident, with no one providing estimates like, it'll be ready in one minute or just two more minutes. Instead, the kitchen is filled with heated arguments. Scott reaches his breaking point and decides it's time to voice his concerns. The former silent partner finally decides to speak up and stand up for his staff and restaurant. I don't want to hear no damn arguing back here. The only person that should be giving orders back here is Aaron. Following these events, operations begin to run smoothly, with Aaron finally asserting control over the kitchen. Aaron takes on the role of a true head chef, instilling accountability among his staff. Scott realizes that this evening has given him an opportunity for redemption and to demonstrate his value to the restaurant. After the third evening service, Ramsey engages in another conversation with the group. This time, he lavishes them with compliments, instilling hope for a brighter future. The menu now features fresh, delectable food, and the owners have begun to establish a more assertive presence with their staff. However, a crucial question lingers. What will happen to AJ? Tamar takes the initiative and addresses his father, conveying that working 80 hours a week is unsustainable. While they don't fire AJ, they opt to reduce his total hours and consequently trim down his $100,000 per year salary to a more manageable figure. In the days following Ramsey's departure, the three owners decide to grant Aaron full authority over the kitchen, the menu, and the staffing. He promptly dismisses two cooks and brings in two new sous chefs. In the end, recognizing the need for a proper general manager, Scott, Bill, and Tamar make the tough decision to part ways with AJ. The episode wraps up with AJ delivering a classic movie-like warning, saying, Perhaps when I'm no longer here, they'll come to appreciate everything I've done for them. It was a challenging choice, especially when involving family, but it was a necessary one. The episode ends on a positive note, with the three owners expressing that their personal relationship has never been better. Fast forward 15 years from the 2008 episode, and the question arises, what became of Jax and its owners? Sadly, the Jax waterfront we witnessed in the episode couldn't sustain its operations, closing in December 2008, merely a month after the episode aired. The establishment underwent a transformation, re-emerging as Dockside Jack's Grill and Tiki Bar in 2009. The specific reasons for the owner's departure from the restaurant remain shrouded in mystery. However, it's likely that financial challenges, exacerbated by the economic conditions of the time, significantly influenced this transition. Not long after, the restaurant and its property found their way back into the hands of the original owners who preceded Jack's. They made the choice to restore the establishment to its original name, Brownies on the Waterfront, the name from when it was first constructed in the 1960s. This name endured until it was subsequently sold and transformed into Jack's in the late 1990s. Their ownership endured until 2022, when the property underwent another change in ownership. This shift led to a complete rebranding of the establishment as Hook, accompanied by extensive renovations that transformed both the exterior and the interior of the building. As of the present day, Hook continues to operate and has received favorable reviews. If you happen to be in the St. Clair Shores area, it might be worth considering a visit. Regarding the guys from the episode, there is limited available information about their activities in the years that followed. Some of them maintain social media profiles on platforms like Facebook and Twitter, but these accounts have remained inactive for a decade or more. For instance, Bill's Twitter page indicates that he pursued a career as a professional bodybuilder. He also operates a fitness company called Evoke Fit. On the company's website, there's a bio section where Bill shared the following. I purchased properties in some of the harshest areas in Detroit. After losing everything in 2010, 
due to the market collapse. I was at a point where I needed healing once more. I just wanted to give up on life. It appears that he managed to make a recovery after facing setbacks, including the loss of his restaurant and a blow to his housing investment during the real estate bubble bust of that era. He frequently shares updates on his company's Instagram page to this day. As for Scott, I came across some old social media posts from a year or two after the Kitchen Nightmares episode. It was evident that he had undergone a remarkable transformation, notably shedding a significant amount of weight and refining his physique. He also ventured into launching a website called Made in Detroit Online, although it no longer exists and can only be assessed through archives. The site carried the slogan, Not Everything in Detroit Sucks, which seemed to resonate with him so deeply that he had it tattooed on his body. Following this endeavor, Scott took on the role of a partner and sales director at Virtual Assistant Task, an online outsourcing company where he continues to work to this day. Tamara reverted to his initial profession as an engineer, rejoining the motor vehicle manufacturing industry. Over the course of his career, he embarked on a remarkable international journey. For two years, he was stationed in Brazil, contributing his expertise to Ford's South American Operations Design Center. Subsequently, he relocated to Shanghai, China, where he dedicated five years to working on steering systems. In 2017, he returned to his home state of Michigan, where he continues to reside. Presently, he holds the position of vice president in his portfolio for the ZF Group. Along this journey, Tamar also started a family, and from the images, he appears quite content with the life he's built. Here, he embodies the role of a quintessential Michigan dad, teaching his child how to skate. Before taking the reins at Jack's, AJ had been the owner of Izzy's Deli in New Baltimore. Tragically, the deli met a devastating fate in 2006, burning to the ground under mysterious circumstances. Despite extensive investigations, the exact cause of the fire remained elusive and has remained a subject of uncertainty in my research. I don't have any information about what happened to AJ after Kitchen Nightmares. Also, my search didn't provide any additional information about Chef Aaron. Among the characters in this episode, he was the one I had the highest hopes for. I couldn't even find his last name which made researching his post-show career quite challenging. I was eager to learn how his professional journey unfolded in the 15 years following the show. He displayed the potential to become a remarkable chef. He simply needed the right team to support him. I genuinely hope that he eventually found his ideal kitchen situation to thrive in. In my opinion, Jack's Waterfront as an episode of Kitchen Nightmares is a hidden gem, often overlooked and underrated. While some episodes of the show may have garnered more attention, what made this episode stand out was a genuine potential for transformation. Viewers could see that with the right guidance and changes, Jax had the opportunity to turn things around. While it's probable that the great economic recession contributed to the restaurant's downfall, the interwoven conflicts among the staff, the kitchen's challenges, and the dining room's issues forged a complex narrative that held the viewer's attention. The emergence of Chef Aaron as a beacon of hope provided a captivating narrative and someone you genuinely want to root for. It's a compelling story of second chances, making it an underrated treasure in the Kitchen Nightmares series.